It's Thursday, December 29th. Russia attacks Ukraine with explosive drones, air and sea-based missiles in the biggest wave of military strikes in weeks. Benjamin Netanyahu returns as prime minister for an unprecedented sixth term. He leads the most right-wing and religiously conservative government in Israel's history. The first in a series of storms is hitting the San Francisco Bay Area. A flood watch will be in effect from Friday night into Saturday. Southwest Airlines promises to return to normal operations tomorrow following more than a week of travel chaos. President Biden signs the $1.7 trillion spending bill to fund the government through the end of September. And soccer great Pele dies of cancer in Brazil at the age of 82. From the studios of KPFA in Berkeley, this is the Pacifica Evening News. I'm Eileen Alfandari. Russian missiles hit Ukraine today in the biggest wave of strikes in weeks, damaging power stations and other critical infrastructure during freezing winter weather. Ukraine's military chief said that Russia fired 69 missiles at energy facilities and Ukrainian forces shot down 54 of them. Local officials said attacks killed at least two people around Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city. The strikes also wounded at least seven people across the country although the toll of the attacks was growing as officials assessed the day's events. The Ukrainian Air Force said that Russia dispatched explosive drones to selected regions overnight before broadening the barrage with air and sea-based missiles. Ukraine's defense ministry said the attack damaged 18 residential buildings and 10 pieces of critical infrastructure in 10 regions. Russia has attacked Ukrainian power and water supplies almost weekly since October, while its ground forces struggle to hold ground and to advance. Mayor Vitaly Klitschko warned of power outages in the capital, asking people to stockpile water and to charge their electronic devices. Ukraine's foreign minister called the attacks senseless barbarism. Karen Chamas reports. Kiev residents woke up to the thunderous sound of heavy Russian shelling. Ukraine's military said schools of Russian missiles were fired at Ukrainian energy facilities, but that Ukrainian forces managed to shoot down a large number of them. Russia dispatched explosive drones to selected regions overnight, before broadening the barrage with cruise missiles in the morning. In Kiev, residents such as Anastasia are defiant and frustrated at the relentless disruption to their daily lives. We're just tired of this and we don't have special concerns. Yes, we're trying to react and go to the shelter, but this interrupts our life. I'm Karen Chamas. France's defense minister has pledged further military support for Ukraine, insisting his government's backing is unflagging while outreach efforts are also being made with Russia to try to set in motion an eventual negotiated end to the war. Sarah Coates reports from Paris. With Russia's war on Ukraine now well into its 10th month, French Defense Minister Le Cornu has visited the Ukrainian capital, announcing during a press conference Presidents Zelensky and Macron have requested proposals for a common agenda on French military support for the month of January. Le Cornu's trip winding up just hours ahead of yet another large-scale Russian attack on Ukraine, with its defence ministry saying that 69 cruise missiles were launched from both the air and the sea. That's Sarah Coates reporting. Meantime, Belarus's state-run news agency reported that a Ukrainian missile landed in Belarus during the missile strikes. Belarus has allowed Russia to use its territory as a launch pad for its war on Ukraine, but says it will not send troops to participate in the war. In Israel, hundreds marched in Jerusalem in protest of the inauguration of Benjamin Netanyahu. They denounced the most far-right religious government in Israel's history. Demonstrators waved Israeli and LGBTQ rainbow flags in protest of the ultra-nationalist, racist, and 
homophobic members of Netanyahu's new government. They include Itamar ben Gavir, a far-right politician who was convicted of inciting anti-Arab racism and supporting a terrorist group in 2017. He will be in charge of the National Police Force as the newly created National Security Minister. Netanyahu took an offensive stance in his inauguration speech, taking aim at Iran as opposition members of parliament heckled him. His comments were translated by Al Jazeera. We will guarantee Israel's military advantage in the region through increasing empowerment. The first mission is to make sure that Iran won't annihilate us with nuclear bombs. And you dismiss it as if it isn't important, as if it's a small thing. Thank you very much, you who supported the nuclear agreement. Why are you shouting? Why don't you listen? You might learn something. Who are you to tell us? Who are you to educate us? Netanyahu and his allies have pledged to make expansion of West Bank settlements one of their top priorities. That's likely to deepen the conflict with Palestinians. All Israeli settlements are illegal under international law. In Palestine, a spokesman for Hamas, Hazem Qasim, said the new government will escalate tensions. His comments also translated by Al Jazeera. It's clear that today we're facing a new Zionist government, the most extreme, terrorist, racist and fascist government, with policies that clearly escalate the aggression against what we hold sacred, our people and our Palestinian land. This opens the way to real escalation on the ground in all the Palestinian land. This opens the way to real escalation on the ground in all arenas. The new Israeli government has promised to curb the power of the country's independent judiciary, specifically a bill that would allow parliament to overturn Supreme Court decisions with a simple majority of 61 lawmakers. Critics say that law will undermine government checks and balances and erode a critical democratic institution. They also say Netanyahu has a conflict of interest in pushing for the illegal overhaul because he's currently charged with corruption. More on the new Israeli government from Corinne Smith. The new Israeli government is a coalition of previously far-right and ultra-religious conservative parties behind Netanyahu. Curry Peterson Smith is the Michael Ratner Middle East Fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies and says it's likely to be an escalation of an already nightmarish year of violence and repression of Palestinians. Their entire campaign, and not only the formal campaigning on the, as part of the election, but the rhetoric, what they've said at their rallies, what they have actually done joining far-right Israelis in the streets as they chant death to Arabs, uh, celebrating the demolition of homes in East Jerusalem. Um, the videos that we've seen in recent weeks of Israeli Defense Forces soldiers at checkpoints in the West Bank saying, now that our people are in power, we can do whatever we want. There are approximately 2.5 million Palestinians living in the occupied West Bank. Their movements are severely restricted by the Israeli military. Several of Netanyahu's key allies, including the religious Zionist party, are ultra-nationalist West Bank settlers. Peterson Smith says that members of the new government have pledged to crack down on Palestinians and Israelis who oppose settlements. We can also expect, or at least what this government is planning, and they're very open about it, are more measures to undermine what little remains in terms of the democratic rights of Palestinians primarily. Though it must be said also that this government, the people who make up this government, have been hostile to Israelis who in any way challenge the kind of violence against Palestinians. Palestinians have continued to denounce Israel's escalating threats and attacks. And Peterson Smith says there is a struggle within the Palestinian population to find political unity and leadership in opposition to Israel. There are these conversations happening, and they're happening under tremendous pressure. I mean, again, You've got, on one hand, a sort of collective figuring out of what parties will represent us. What are the various ways to participate? For those of us who are citizens, uh, we can vote, but for which parties and so on. And at the same time, you've got an incoming government saying, if you step out of line, 
you know, we will strip you of your your citizenship. Peterson Smith says the far-right ultra-nationalist political movement behind this new government has taken shape with the support of the United States. Former President Donald Trump was a close political ally of Netanyahu. One of the strongest shows of support was Trump recognizing all of Jerusalem as Israel's capital and moving the U.S. embassy there, violating Palestinian claims and decades of foreign policy precedent. This year, the Biden administration quietly moved forward with that plan and building a new embassy in Jerusalem. The compound is to be constructed on land appropriated from Palestinians. Peterson Smith says that diverges from the president's rhetoric supporting democracy and human rights. And instead, it's an active show of support for Israeli occupation. It speaks to, I think, a contrast between what the White House is saying about the far right in this country. That is, there's a conversation where President Biden is saying we have to stand up for democracy Trump represents a grave threat to democratic rights, um, and so on. And yet the embassy move um, in particular, but there are many other examples, is such an endorsement of not only Trump's personal ally, Benjamin Netanyahu, um, in in Israel, but the whole kind of move um, against any democratic rights for Palestinians, its far-right government in Israel. Netanyahu is returning as prime minister. He was removed from office last year after 12 years in power after parties united in opposition to his rule. He will take office while on trial for allegedly accepting bribes, breach of trust, and fraud, charges he denies. For KPFA News, I'm Corinne Smith. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has issued a call for peace in his New Year's message. Guterres says after a year of brutal warfare from Afghanistan to Ukraine, forcing record numbers to flee their homes, the world needs peace more than ever. Peace with one another through dialogue to end conflict. Peace with nature and our climate to build a more sustainable world. Peace in the home so women and girls can live in dignity and safety. Peace on the streets and in our communities with the full protection of all human rights. Peace in our places of worship with respect for each other's beliefs. And peace online, free from hate speech and abuse. In 2023, let's put peace at the heart of our words and actions. Together, let's make 2023 a year when peace is restored to our lives, our homes and our world. Guterres said that in 2022, more than 100 million people were forced to flee violence, wildfires, drought, poverty, and hunger. This is the Pacifica Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KFCF Fresno. I'm Eileen Alfandiri. President Biden has signed the $1.7 trillion spending bill that will keep the federal government operating through the end of next September, which is the end of the fiscal year. He signed the bill in the Virgin Islands where he's vacationing with his family. The funding bill includes a roughly 6% increase in spending for domestic programs to $772.5 billion. Spending on the military will increase by about 10% to a whopping $858 billion. The measure contains roughly $45 billion for Ukraine and NATO allies, more than even Biden had requested. Roads reopened and storm-besieged Buffalo as authorities continued searching for people who may have died or are stuck in suffering after last week's blizzard. The driving ban in New York's second most populous city was lifted just after midnight. At least 40 deaths in western New York, most of them in Buffalo, have been reported from the blizzard that raged across much of the country, with Buffalo in its crosshairs on Friday and Saturday. Erie County Executive Mark Polenkars said some victims have yet to be identified. Unfortunately, there are families in this community uh, who still have not been able to identify where a loved one is. They're missing, and we do have still uh, John Doe's. And eventually those family members are going to find out the worst news possible. The National Guard had just about completed its wellness checks, going door-to-door to check on people who lost power. Authorities faced the possibility of finding more victims as snow melted amid increasingly mild weather. 
In the Bay Area, another round of stormy weather is here and to last through the weekend from a series of fronts. An initial wave of rain arrived today with a potent atmospheric river following by the weekend, bringing warnings for floods and low-lying elevations from Friday through Saturday and heavy mountain snow in high elevations. Southwest Airlines said it expects to return to normal operations tomorrow after more than a week of widespread flight cancellations that started with a winter storm and spiraled out of control because of a breakdown with staffing technology. Today, Southwest canceled another 2,350 flights, nearly 60 percent of its schedule. Southwest declined to say how many travelers have been affected, but it's likely that more than one million have had a flight canceled. The airline has scrapped more than 13,000 flights since December 22nd, according to the tracking service FlightAware. Southwest said it will refund tickets on canceled flights. Executives repeated a promise to reimburse travelers who were forced to pay for hotel rooms, meals, and flights on other airlines. The airline's chief commercial officer said the process will take several weeks. Executives said the airline also will pay to ship baggage that has piled up at airports around the country. World soccer sensation Pele has died at the age of 82. The Brazilian king of soccer won a record three World Cups and became one of the most commanding sports figures of the last century. Pele had undergone treatment for colon cancer since 2021. The medical center where he had been hospitalized for the last month said he died of multiple organ failure as a result of the cancer. Widely regarded as one of soccer's greatest players, Pele spent nearly two decades as the game's most prolific scorer with the Brazilian club Santos and the Brazilian national team. Jody Jacobs reports. Pele helped make football one of the world's most popular sports. He rose from small-town life in Brazil to represent coastal team Santos at 15 years old. He played for the Brazilian national team in the World Cup at 17 and went on to become the only player to help their team win the international tournament three times. Pele was two-footed. He had pace, stamina and a full set of skills to head pass, tackle and above all score goals. He initially retired in 1974 but became broke after making bad investments and accepted an offer with the North American Soccer League to play in New York. When the US won the rights to host the 1994 World Cup, Pele was seen as the most important reason why. Pele has six known children. His daughter confirmed his death from cancer on Thursday. His Twitter page reads, Inspiration and love mark the journey of King Pele, who peacefully passed away today. Love, love, and love forever. And that's Jody Jacobs. Brazil's president-elect Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva announced that Amazon activist Marina Silva will be the country's next environment minister. The announcement indicates his administration will prioritize cracking down on illegal deforestation, even if it means running afoul of powerful agribusiness interests. Both Lula and Silva attended the recent UN climate conference in Egypt, where Lula promised cheering crowds zero deforestation in the Amazon, which is the world's largest rainforest and a key to fighting climate change. Silva was Lula's environment minister in his previous administration, where she oversaw the creation of dozens of conservation areas and a sophisticated strategy against deforestation, with major operations against environmental crime and new satellite surveillance. She also helped design the largest international effort to preserve the rainforest, the mostly Norway-backed Amazon Fund. Deforestation dropped dramatically. But Lula and Silva fell out as he began catering to farmers during his second term, and Silva resigned in 2008. Lula appears to have convinced her that he has changed tack, and she joined his campaign after he embraced her proposals for preservation. In her own appearance at the UN COP27 summit, Silva said Lula's administration would protect force and lead the way in fighting climate change. 
The European Union isn't ready yet to go along with member nation Italy, which is requiring coronavirus tests for airline passengers arriving from China. The EU's executive arm says the BF.7 Omicron variant prevalent in China was already circulating in Europe and that its threat has not significantly grown. Italian officials said more than 50 percent of people screened upon arrival from China at Milan's airport in recent days tested positive. But German's health ministry said there's no indication that a more dangerous variant has developed in the current mass outbreak of COVID in China. Trent Murray reports. The Italian government has announced it will be testing all arrivals from China for COVID-19 and is calling on other European Union countries to also do the same. Health authorities in Milan earlier reported that almost half of the passengers on two separate flights from China had tested positive for the virus following the country's reopening. In Germany, a spokesperson for the health ministry said they are monitoring the situation in China, quote, very, very closely. Meanwhile, in Austria, they say they have no plans to begin testing, instead celebrating the return of Chinese travellers for the coming tourist season. Trent Murray, Berlin. The chief epidemiologist for China's Center for Disease Control says the upcoming Lunar New Year holiday could lead to a new surge of infections as millions of Chinese travel home to rural areas. The development of the epidemic is relatively fast in big and medium-sized cities because of their large and dense populations. It's slower in smaller cities and rural areas. It's been a severe winter, and with the upcoming Spring Festival, when many people will be travelling, the risk of infectious respiratory diseases may make the epidemic situation more complicated. The remarks were translated by Al Jazeera. The Chinese government has stopped reporting nationwide case numbers, but announcements by some cities indicate at least tens and possibly hundreds of millions of people in the world's most populous nation may have been infected since the surge began in early October. Experts have predicted one to two million deaths in China from COVID through the end of next year. ExxonMobil has sued the European Union to stop imposition of a windfall profits tax. The energy giant calls the tax counterproductive and says it will undermine investor confidence. The EU tax is aimed at the profits of fossil fuel companies that exceed a four-year historical average by 20 percent. California Governor Gavin Newsom has proposed a state windfall profits tax. Lawmakers are supposed to consider it in early January. Benji Heyer reports. The U.S. multinational corporation recorded a third quarter profit of almost $20 billion in 2022. The EU's temporary windfall tax was introduced back in September, taxing profits exceeding historical averages. But Exxon has accused Brussels of surpassing the executive's legal authority. Benji Heyer, London. A federal appeals court has denied the Oglala Sioux tribe's request for a review of a U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission decision to grant a license for a uranium mine in southwestern South Dakota. That's despite the fact that the tribe was not individually consulted on the potential impact to cultural resources. The Oglala Sioux have mounted a years-long effort to halt the uranium mine, arguing the project would endanger cultural and environmental resources on land that historically belonged to the Great Sioux Nation. Although the board found the tribe was not adequately consulted, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission kept the license in place because it said the tribe had failed to show it suffered irreparable harm from the licensing process. Lee Strubinger has more on the story. The tribe says the Nuclear Regulatory Commission did not follow the process of the National Environmental Policy Act and National Historic Preservation Act to protect the tribe's cultural and historic resources. Travis Stills is an attorney with Energy and Conservation Law out of Durango, Colorado. He says the ruling means the NRC's permits will get issued, but without a full assessment of what negative effects to cultural, resource, and groundwater will be. It's ends up on turning on some fairly narrow technical questions of law, but the result is the court 
allowed the NRC to go ahead with licensing without being informed of the serious impacts that its licensing decisions would have on uh, the cultural resources of the Lakota, especially the uh, Ogallala Sioux Tribe. The tribe has a 90-day period to appeal the decision to the U.S. Supreme Court. Mark Hollenbeck is the project manager for the Dewey Burdock site. He says the appeals court ruling is expected. We have won everyone along the way, and we expect to continue that way. And uh, it'll just go through the process. Hollenbeck has sought permits for the project since 2012. Two EPA permits are also under review. State permits for the project are on hold until federal permit appeals conclude. Recently, Fall River County voters designated uranium mining as a nuisance. Backers say it halts uranium production in the county. Project proponents call the measure illegal. It's unclear whether that designation will get challenged in court. For National Native News, I'm Lee Strubinger. The House January 6th committee has dropped the subpoena against former President Trump as the committee closes its investigation and prepares to dissolve next week. Committee Chair Benny Thompson wrote a letter to Trump's legal team yesterday formally withdrawing the subpoena. Thompson wrote, quote, in light of the imminent end of our investigation, the select committee can no longer pursue the specific information covered by the subpoena. The January 6th committee unanimously voted to subpoena the former president in October, demanding testimony and documents. However, Trump was widely expected to dodge the panel's request to produce documents and sit for a deposition, and he sued to block the subpoena in November. The January 6th committee released 19 more transcripts of interviews today. In one, former Donald Trump attorney Christina Bob says South Carolina Republican Senator Lindsey Graham told Trump aides and allies that he would love to, quote, support the cause of showing, quote, all the fraud involved in the presidential election. Bob recalled a conversation she said Lindsey Graham had with Trump attorney Rudy Giuliani, in which he asked Giuliani for information regarding purported voter fraud in Georgia that he could present during the January 6th joint session of Congress. She said Graham told Giuliani, quote, just give me five dead voters. Give me, you know, an example of illegals voting. Just give me a very small snapshot that I can take and champion. Bob said Graham received a memo from the legal team, but ultimately did nothing with the information. The January 6th committee also released transcripts from its interviews with Donald Trump Jr., his fiancée, Kimberly Guilfoyle, failed Pennsylvania Republican gubernatorial candidate Doug Mastriano, and former Trump aide Stephen Miller. New York has opened its first legal dispensary for recreational marijuana. The widely anticipated opening of the first state-sanctioned dispensary, which is operated by the nonprofit Housing Works, paves the way for a string of openings expected in the coming months in New York. The state legalized recreational marijuana use in March of 2021. The store opened to the public at 4.20 p.m. Chris Alexander, the inaugural executive director of the state cannabis office, made the first purchase. Legalization for us has never been about uh, just freeing the plant. Uh, recognized really early the intersectionality of this issue, the way that we could use uh, this fight to uplift other fights, other voices, and not just significant criminal justice reform, uh, access to health care, as you all uh, drive on those conversations, um, but also making sure that we're creating opportunity in a new way. Um, that we're prioritizing uh, repairing harm, harm that's been done uh, even by the state's own policies. New York plans a $200 million public-private fund to aid social equity marijuana businesses, which the law defined as those owned by women or people of color, struggling farmers, disabled veterans, and people from communities that endure disproportionate criminalization of cannabis-related offenses. The first dispensary is owned by the nonprofit Housing Works. Officials said having a marijuana business will help fund its programs. The nonprofit is a people of color controlled social service agency that serves clients with HIV and AIDS, as well as those who are homeless and formerly incarcerated. 
This is the Pacifica Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KFCF Fresno. This newscast airs each night at 6, half-hour editions on the weekend. You can listen to it archived online at kpfa.org, or you can subscribe to the Pacifica Evening News as a podcast. I'm Eileen Alfandari. A Colorado man has been arrested for investigation of committing hate crimes in California after two young adults of Asian descent were targeted with racist and homophobic comments as they recorded a TikTok food review video at an In-N-Out Burger restaurant. The incident occurred Christmas Eve in San Ramon. After the video was posted online, police detectives contacted the victims and began an investigation that led to the arrest of Jordan Douglas Crawl of Colorado. The incident follows a rise in hate incidents against people of Asian descent during the pandemic and increasing hateful rhetoric toward LGBTQ people online and in person. The Idaho Public Utilities Commission has cleared the way for one of the state's major utilities, which also serves part of Oregon, to drastically cut back what it pays solar rooftop owners for excess electricity they send back to the grid. The Idaho PUC's move follows on the heels of a similar decision by the California Public Utilities Commission. Eric Tegatoff reports that as in California, Solar advocates in Idaho warn the change will lead to a decline in the purchase of solar rooftop systems and the fight against global warming. A recent move by the Idaho Public Utilities Commission could mean solar panel owners in the state could receive less money from Idaho Power. The PUC accepted the utility's value of distributed energy resources study, which concluded compensation rates for solar panel owners should be lower. The utility would reduce the current 8 to 10 cents per kilowatt hour compensation rate to only 2.8 to 4 cents per kilowatt hour. An independent study showed that the same power is worth nearly five times more and that the report had errors like outdated energy prices. Lisa Young with the Idaho chapter of the Sierra Club says she believes this is a way for the utility to continue continue to advance towards their clean energy goals, but do so on their own terms. Once these solar compensation rates are going to be reduced, it's going to be a lot harder for folks to go solar, to afford putting solar on their roof, on their farm, on their business, and it's going to disincentivize those investments. With the study approved, Young says Idaho Power will now present more concrete changes to the PUC next year. Those changes will focus on Idaho Power's solar net metering program, which will likely include other structural changes to measuring power and billing. She says it'll also be another chance for public input. Young says despite receiving significant public comment and hearing six hours of public testimony in opposition to the study in late October and early November, the PUC approved it anyway without requiring any additional changes from the utility. She says the lack of consideration is disappointing. Youth from the Idaho Climate Justice League, some of whom testified, wrote an open letter to the commissioners voicing their frustration. Young people are are really upset. They have done so much to try to raise awareness, raise the alarm, really plead with those in power, the public utilities commissioners, to make the right decision. According to the Sierra Club, if the rates from Idaho Power study are implemented, their rooftop solar compensation rates could be among the lowest of any utility in the country, which they believe will impact solar jobs and local businesses in Idaho. For Northern Rockies News Connection, I'm Alex Gonzalez. The number of people seeking unemployment benefits rose modestly last week. The Labor Department said that applications for unemployment for the week ending December 24th climbed by 9,000 to 225,000. Unemployment benefit applications are a proxy for layoffs. They're being closely monitored by economists as the Federal Reserve has rapidly raised interest rates in an effort to slow job growth and inflation. Should the Fed's rate hikes cause a recession, as many economists fear, a jump in layoffs and unemployment claims are considered an early sign. The Environmental Protection Agency has ordered the Federal Army Corps of Engineers to stop discharging oil and other pollutants into the Columbia River from four dams in Washington and Oregon. The environmental group Columbia Riverkeeper says the toxic chemicals harm fish and other wildlife in the Columbia and Snake Rivers and sued the Corps last year to force the discharges to stop. Mark Moran reports. 
The EPA has ordered the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to stop oil and other toxic chemical discharges into the Columbia River in Washington and Oregon. Recent spills have the issue back at the forefront. The group Columbia Riverkeeper sued the Corps last year and says these pollutants harm fish and other wildlife in the Columbia and Snake Rivers. Miles Johnson, the group's senior attorney, says the permits address four dams along the river that are pollution sources, and the problem is bigger than petroleum and chemical pollution. In addition, the dams create big reservoirs that soak up the sun's energy and make the river too hot for salmon and steelhead. The permits that EPA issued to the Army Corps uh, are a directive to deal with some of those problems. In operating the dams, the Corps will be required to use environmentally friendly lubricants, pay closer attention to water temperatures in those reservoirs, and remove water from some of them if they get too hot for the fish to survive. The issue was highlighted again recently when between 300 and 600 gallons of oil leaked into the Snake River from a turbine at Little Goose Dam in eastern Washington. Johnson says this type of pollution has become a pattern with the Corps and has to be monitored and addressed constantly. Sometimes it's one gallon, sometimes it's five gallons, sometimes it's hundreds of gallons or even thousands of gallons. And sometimes that oil contains toxic uh, chemicals like PCBs. And after watching it happen over and over again, Columbia Riverkeeper took action, which is what we do when someone illegally discharges pollution into the river. The EPA took the action under the Clean Water Act. Columbia Riverkeeper has sued federal and state agencies multiple times and continues to monitor Northwest waterways and the wildlife that depend on them. For Washington News Service, I'm Mark Moran. The Office of Hawaiian Affairs recently released a report on missing and murdered Native Hawaiian women and girls. The report was compiled after more than a year of data collection and worked by a task force focusing on missing and murdered Native Hawaiian people. Antonia Gonzalez reports. Advocates, task force members, and state lawmakers recently held a press conference at the state capitol in Honolulu to discuss the release of the first official report. Some key findings, more than a quarter of missing girls in Hawaii are Native Hawaiian. Hawaii has the eighth highest rate of missing persons in the U.S., and the average profile of a missing person in Hawaii is a 15-year-old Native Hawaiian girl missing on Oahu. Kara Jabola Karolas is the executive director of the State Commission on the Status of Women and Task Force co-chair. On one hand, these findings are startling. And then on the other hand, this report really doesn't say anything new. Instead, it vindicates and validates what Native Hawaiians, sex trafficking, and gender-based violence service providers and feminist activists have been saying all along and have been told that they were exaggerating or manipulating facts or just simply providing an anecdote. Task Force members say another concerning finding is documentation that shows the U.S. military directly contributes to child sexual exploitation in Hawaii, pointing to law enforcement operations involving men arrested for trying to have sexual encounters with 13-year-olds online. Advocates are calling on the U.S. military to be on the task force. They're also seeking more data collection and for state lawmakers to work with law enforcement, advocates, and survivors to craft policies to protect women and girls. The task force was created by the state legislature in 2021. Another report is expected to be released in 2023. I'm Antonia Gonzalez. Napa State Senator Bill Dodd has introduced legislation to expedite the return of Native American remains and cultural items held by the University of California. Although repatriation laws exist, an audit released in November showed UC has been inconsistent. An initiative by the Wisconsin Department of Transportation is honoring tribal communities with highway signs in both English and Native American languages. Katie Thorson reports. No matter where you go in the country or state, highway signs for places are fairly uniform. Giant green signs with big block letters in white mark the location, letting you know what town or city you're in. A new sign recently installed in Mole Lake prominently reads Sakagan Chippewa Community with the tribe's seal beside it. But different from the vast majority of similar signs you find across the country, this one includes the tribe's name in their own Ojibwe Moan language. Sagai Ganin. It's a, it's a, it's a spiritual, uh, cultural light that was in the water. It was part of our 
part of our teachings and our migration stories and our teachings that, that came about um, a long, long time ago. Sakagan Chippewa Community Chairman Robert Van Zyl was proud to unveil the new sign in a ceremony alongside community members and officials from federal and state transportation offices. It's very positive, it's heartwarming to see these dual language signs come to life. The Sakagan Chippewa community is the fourth tribe in Wisconsin to install a dual language sign. The Wisconsin Department of Transportation launched the initiative in 2021. Wisconsin DOT Secretary Craig Thompson would like to work with all of the tribes within the state to get these signs up. It's become um, uh, a priority to bring back uh, and preserve native languages. And so this was one way that we could help and participate in that. But it's also important for people in Wisconsin, people traveling through Wisconsin, to know our history, know when they're entering uh, these seven nations, and to see it in the initial language. So we, we think it's, it's important on all those fronts. And it is that sovereignty that Van Zyl hopes people will think of when they see that sign. Because when you have your language, your culture, and your identity, you have sovereignty. And so that's what we want to express to, to people. I'm Katie Thorson reporting. After more than 10 months of fighting, Russia and Ukraine are locked in a grinding battle of attrition, with both sides suffering misery and death. Ukrainian Foreign Minister Kuleba said Monday his nation wants a peace summit within two months at the United Nations, with Secretary General Antonio Guterres as mediator. He said Russia must face a war crimes tribunal before Ukraine directly talks to Moscow, but that other nations should feel free to engage with the Russians. Comment on the summit proposal, Russian Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Zakharova today dismissed it as delirious and hollow. She described the proposal as a publicity stunt by Washington that tries to cast the Kyiv regime as a peacemaker. Russian officials have said that any peace plan can only proceed from Kyiv's recognition of Russian sovereignty over the regions it annexed from Ukraine in September. We spend the rest of tonight's newscast bringing you a view from Ukraine and another on prospects for peace. Ivan Golmsma is academic director of the Public Policy and Governance Program at the Kyiv School of Economics. He spoke to Pacifica's Ursula Rutenberg from Kyiv during a window of time when he had electricity on December 23rd. Golmsma discussed how he and others are surviving the winter with limited electricity, water, and heat. He also elaborated from the Ukrainian perspective— what Ukrainian President Zelensky's visit to the U.S. meant, as well as the broader relationship between Russia and Ukraine as imperial and client states. Professor Gomza researches democratization, authoritarian regimes, popular movements, good governance, and has written extensively about the war. He began by describing how he and others in Kyiv are surviving with limited and erratic electricity supplies in the dead of winter. Most of the time we don't have it. The previous outage was for 50 consecutive hours. And just several days ago, it was like three hours per day that we had electricity. Uh, This day, we actually had no electricity at all. The power, it appeared at 1 a.m., it disappeared at 3 a.m., and then I haven't had it until just the very beginning of our conversation. Uh, I'm talking about Kyiv. In Odessa or Lviv, the situation is quite different. People there have schedules. It's four to four, four hours. They have power, then it is power cut for quite a precise four hours, and then they have it back again. Kyiv, actually, it is unpredictable. You don't know when the power will go out and when it will reappear. And just, you know, to compound the situation, when you don't have power, the water pumps don't work or you don't have water. And if you don't have water, it means you cannot flush the toilet, you cannot wash the dishes. On the other hand, I'm not complaining because at least I have gas. So if I want, I can cook something on a gas cooker. In other districts of Kyiv, there is no gas supply because those districts, they were constructed in the late Soviet period and the new idea was developed at that period that well, maybe we don't need gas supply, gas uh, central system in residential apartments. So there, people actually are equipped with electrical cookers. So for them, it is difficult because everything depends on electricity. What about heat? 
At my apartment, I have an individual boiler which works on electricity. So no electricity, no heat mm. uh, supplied. So yeah, it is cold. Yeah. So you may in fact have a cold and dark Christmas. He's correct. He is correct. Most people who live in central Ukraine and Kiev is in central Ukraine, they are bound to have cold and dark Christmas. How are you and other people coping? What What's the secret to being able to cope with this? Personally, like my family, my wife and yeah, my child, we have a kid, three years old. So we bought a special huge power bank. It is called uh, EcoFlow. It works like an accumulator. So you plug it in and it collects energy and it is enough for eight hours. So I can plug it in and have some heat at my apartment. Or it lasts enough to hold the fridge for three hours. Or alternatively, it is enough to have 12 hours of internet, which is very important for <laughs> my mm. professional life. The sound which you hear the most in Kyiv nowadays is the humming of the diesel generators. They're actually everywhere. The cafes, mm. the huge supermarkets, and there are more and more of them. You cannot equip them in your apartment because of the fumes. But it is enough, you know, to have businesses. So that's what actually helps us to cope. And also there are some so-called points of resilience. Those are places especially equipped by the government where you can go and charge your electric devices mm. located in some schools or governmental offices. Sometimes they are in air raid shelters. That the reality is also with us. I mean, air raids are constant and danger of being bombed. So for people to get some power supply, those uh, points of resilience, they are predominantly in more safe places. So you can get online there and you can charge your phone or is that what basically people yes. do there? Yeah, exactly. They charge phones and other devices. For instance, you can take the EcoFlow, the huge power bank I mentioned, and try to <laughs> charge it there. Mm. When President Zelensky was speaking, he said that this war will define whether it will be democracy for Ukrainians and Americans. And I, I think he alluded to the, uh, the courage of the Ukrainians making this happen. How do you feel about being asked to shoulder this well, as a political scientist, you know, I actually consider this as the war for existence. I mean, I do agree with the president that after the war, actually, one of two regimes will be no more. So either there will be no democratic Ukraine or there will be no more Putinist kleptocratic Russia. When I say will bring, I don't mean that mm. immediately after the war, but in two, three years, there will be very profound, important repercussions for Russia if it loses. Are you kind of saying that in order for this invasion to stop, Russia has to change? Unlike many in Ukraine, I don't claim that a regime change in Russia is necessary. Many people actually claim that either we topple Putin or we are going to have the same situation in a year, in a two, whatever. Uh, it is not my point of view. What I am saying is that actually one way or another, when Putin loses, his regime will be changed. I heard a quote from one of the Russian officials responding to Zelensky's visit, something to the effect of, well, what happened was that a little man in a rumpled green shirt went across the ocean, something like that was dismissive. I would be curious of your comment about the Russians' attitude towards Ukraine. Well, I mean, it is the way they conceive and perceive Ukraine. I think that the way to describe the Russian attitude to Ukraine is imperialism. So a powerful state and another one is less powerful, second rate, and it actually it's kind of a client state. And you can see that Russians, they are derogatory toward both Ukrainian political project and the president who symbolizes this. So they are, you know, dismissive about Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian war effort, not because either Ukrainian culture or war effort or the president are, you know, inferior, but because they used to think about it as such. 
So the imperialism is actually the foundation of all those derogatory remarks they are making. And actually it is quite predictable because there are many instances when the Soviet behavior toward Ukraine was imperialistic. And so it's only natural that having started an imperialist war in 2022, Putin and his people, his entourage and uh, the Russian people in general, they're actually very imperialistic about Ukraine. When or if Ukraine wins, being, you know, trashed by an inferior quote-unquote power, it actually will be the reason why they will actually have to make some work on their collective psyche, on their attitude to the outside world. So that is the reason why I am predicting actually some trouble for Russia. You know, after the Second World War, Germans had to tackle the question of German guilt, the question of German imperialism. The same is bound to happen for Russia. Zelensky came here and said, we have put a lot behind us and we're committed to democracy. Was this a real shift to democracy? If you take the 1991 independence and uh, you see what has changed in Ukraine through those 30 years, it actually is happening in Ukraine. People are actually much more open in their opinions on politics and policies, and that is a sign of democratization. Another instance is actually that uh, democratization is impossible without the so-called generalized trust. In the post-Soviet times, people actually had little trust. So they perceived others as, you know, some competitors. When people see a stranger and they perceive him or her as a threat. Nowadays, the trust is much higher in Ukraine. Why is that? Precisely because when you have a period of trial, when you see that you can go back to the cafe with a generator, you remember the one I mentioned in the first part of our interview, And the owner there, he says, well, just plug in, don't worry. Yes, it will take some diesel of mine, but I really know that you need some electricity. Or when, for instance, you enlist to the army and let's say you are from ivano frankivsk and you, you speak only Ukrainian. And a guy from Kharkiv who speaks predominantly Russian, he actually enlisted to the army as well to protect his land. That kind of cooperation between different social domains which used to be separated that kind of cooperation it brings trust and that is happening in ukraine we had had many instances when we had to cooperate and that is the biggest difference with russia especially nowadays people try often you know to to say that all oh, ukrainians always were free-minded people and russians they are not i don't agree actually The point I'm making is that due to the peculiarities of our political transition, Ukraine had instances when we had to cooperate and that breed trust and the trust brings democracy. What are your thoughts about going forward? Do you, you agree with Zelensky? Do you think that Ukraine can win this? For sure. I mean, people still cannot believe, especially in the West, that Ukraine can win. And for me, you know, it's like... It's no-brainer. I mean, smaller countries, they win all the time. Vietnam won against France and then the United States. For example, Japan and Russia in 1905. Japan was a much smaller country with a smaller economy and smaller industry, and it won the war. And then let's take another example. I mean, Algeria, it won against France. So we have those instances all over history. Smaller countries do win wars against colossuses. And uh, the reason why is very often for smaller countries, it is the matter of existence. And for bigger countries, it is the matter of, you know, imperial designs. So yes, we can win. I mean, 100,000 of Russians have been killed in Ukraine. And we're going to do it more and more and more. I know it, it sounds cruel, but it's a reality. And then at one moment, they'll do just the, as they, they did in Afghanistan. They, they will say, we are having enough of that. Let's get out. Russians, unlike Ukrainians, they actually don't have something to fight for sooner or, or later. And for them, it is better to be sooner. They understand that they actually have no stake in that war. 
It is about the elites try to impose their notions and ideas and designs. And as a Ukrainian, as a human being, I am really grateful, genuinely grateful for the American people investing, maybe maybe even spending that money on Ukraine. It, it, it really helps enormously. Professor Gomza researches democratization, authoritarian regimes, popular movements, good governance, and has written extensively about the war. The $1.7 trillion spending package President Biden signed into law today contains an additional $45 billion for Ukraine. Longtime anti-war activist and professor... Gilbert Ashkar appeared on Democracy Now! today where he discussed the prospects for peace. Ashkar said the United Nations and China would need to be involved. I can't uh, think of any end of this war without involvement of the UN. I mean, short of, you know, some miracle or some uh, big surprise like uh, the collapse of, uh, of, the, of uh, Putin's uh, government or Putin's regime. I mean, short of something that would completely change the situation. Uh, uh, the, the only way to, to end this war is, uh, is also through the United Nations, the United Nations coming in. And that means also China. Now, I can see that both the United States and China uh, have not been eager to, uh, to let the UN uh, take up this issue and, uh, and move towards, uh, 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 I mean, a lasting peace and just peace, which can only be a peace without annexation, and uh, a peace w- uh, w- based on uh, the right of the people's right to self-determination in disputed territories. That's the uh, peaceful, democratic way of solving such issues, not by war, not by force. We are against the acquisition of territory by force. And this is one of the key principles upon which the United Nations Charter I- is based. And so that's that's the, the 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 point here. I mean, any solution to that should go through the United Nations. Any negotiations should go through the United Nations and respect the principles of the uh, of the UN Charter. Now, uh, I'm not seeing the the Biden administration uh, uh, really uh, active on 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 trying to get to that which would involve also a cooperation with China. And the the Biden administration has been extremely aggressive, extremely hostile to China, continuing the the, uh, hostile policies that uh, were started by by Donald Trump in particular. Uh, uh, And this has been uh, quite uh, counterproductive for the the prospect uh, for for peace, because China very obviously holds a, a key position in that it's the only... Uh, important ally that uh, that uh, Russia may look at, and uh, and therefore uh, China's position uh, would uh, weighs a lot on uh, on whatever decision Russia makes. Gilbert Ashkar is author of a number of books, including Perilous Power, the Mid East and U.S. Foreign Policy. His next book to be published in April is entitled The New Cold War: The United States, Russia, and China from Kosovo to Ukraine. Weather forecast for the San Francisco Bay Area, rain tonight through Saturday with winds to 20 miles per hour. Highs tomorrow in the lower 60s, a flood watch goes into effect tomorrow night. In Fresno in the central San Joaquin Valley, rain tonight, chance of rain tomorrow, otherwise cloudy with a high near 59 degrees. There are two more days to make a 2022 year-end gift to KPFA, easy to do online at kpfa.org. We still have thank you gifts up at our website site you can browse through and we do thank you for all your support this year peter stickney produced recorded portions and is at the controls i'm eileen alfandari KPFA is America's original, listener-supported radio station. Yes, we're the place on the dial that speaks truth to power, but we're also a music discovery platform. Music is part of the genetics of KPFA. We connect Bay Area music lovers to genres that inspire creativity. Help us continue to share the magic of jazz, blues, rock, funk, R&B, gospel, world, and classical music 
by making a donation at kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, 94.3 K232FZ in Monterey, and online worldwide at kpfa.org. 